Thank you.
ഓക്കെ സ്ലൈഡ്സ് കാണാലോ അല്ലെ ഹലോ സ്ലൈഡ്സ് കാണാലോ ഓക്കെ അപ്പം നമുക്ക് കോമൺ മിഡിലിയ ഡിസീസസിലെ മെയിൻ ആയിട്ട് രണ്ട് ഡിസീസ് ആണ് ഈ ഒരു ഇതിൽ നമ്മൾ പഠിക്കുന്നത് ഒന്ന് സെറസ് ഓട്ടൈറ്റിസ് മീഡിയ ഒന്ന് അക്യൂട്ട് ഓട്ടൈറ്റിസ് മീഡിയ അല്ലെങ്കിൽ അക്യൂട്ട് സെപ്പറേറ്റ് ഓട്ടൈറ്റിസ് മീഡിയ അപ്പൊ അതിലേക്ക് കടക്കുന്നതിന് മുന്നേ ഈ ബാച്ചിലെ മലയാളം മനസ്സിലാവാത്ത ആരെല്ലാം ഉണ്ടോ കുഴപ്പമില്ലല്ലോ ആ ഓക്കെ എന്നാ മലയാളം വേണ്ട ശരി ഓക്കെ അപ്പം ബിഫോർ വി ഗെറ്റ് ഇൻ ടു ദീസ് ഡിസീസസ് ഇൻ സ്പെസിഫിക് ദാറ്റ് ഇസ് സീറസ് ഓട്ടേറ്റിസ് മീഡിയ ആൻഡ് അക്യൂട്ട് സെപ്പറേറ്റ് ഓട്ടേറ്റിസ് മീഡിയ ഓർ അക്യൂട്ട് ഓട്ടേറ്റിസ് മീഡിയ യു നീഡ് ടു ഹാവ് എ ജസ്റ്റ് ആൻഡ് അണ്ടർസ്റ്റാൻഡിംഗ് ഓഫ് ദ റെലവെന്റ് അനാറ്റമി ദാറ്റ് ഇസ് ദ ഇയർ നോസ് ആൻഡ് ത്രൂട്ട് ദീസ് ത്രീ ആർ ഇന്റർകണക്റ്റഡ് യു ഷുഡ് ബി നോയിങ് ദാറ്റ് ഇസ് നേസൽ കാവിറ്റീസ് ഡയറക്ട്ലി പോസ്റ്റീരിയർലി ഇസ് ഇൻ കോൺടാക്ട് വിത്ത് നേസ് ഓഫ് ഹാരിങ്സ് ആൻഡ് നേസ് ഓഫ് ഹാരിങ്സ് ഇൻഫീരിയർലി ഇൻ കോൺടാക്ട് വിത്ത് ഓറോ ഓഫ് ഹാരിങ്സ് Nasopharynx laterally via the ഫാരിങ്സ് ലാറ്ററലി വയ ദ യൂ സ്റ്റേഷൻ ട്യൂ ഇസ് ഇൻ കണക്ഷൻ വിത്ത് ദ മിഡിൽ ഇയർ സോ യു ഷുഡ് ബി നോയിങ് ദിസ് അനാറ്റമി നേസൽ കാവിറ്റി പോസ്റ്റീരിയർലി നേസോ ഫാരിങ്സ് ഇൻഫീരിയർലി ഓറോ ഫാരിങ്സ് ആൻഡ് നേസോ ഫാരിങ്സ് ലാറ്ററലി വയ ദ യൂ സ്റ്റേഷൻ ട്യൂ ഇൻ ടു ദ മിഡിൽ ഇയർ സോ വിൽ സ്റ്റാർട്ട് ഫസ്റ്റ് വിൽ ബിഗിൻ വിത്ത് സിറസ് ഓട്ടൈറ്റിസ് മീഡിയ സിറസ് ഓട്ടൈറ്റിസ് മീഡിയ ദി അതർ നെയിംസ് ഓഫ് ദിസ് ഡിസീസ് ആർ ഓട്ടൈറ്റിസ് മീഡിയ വിത്ത് എഫ്യൂഷൻ സെക്രട്ടറി ഓട്ടൈറ്റിസ് മീഡിയ mucoid otitis media glue ear so when you begin serous otitis media you should be knowing the definition the definition we can get from the words itself that is serous otitis media otitis media means inflammation or infection of the middle ear and serous means non purulent that is purulent discharge of pus is not there this is serous or non purulent discharge so it can be defined as it is an in- these each word in this definition is important okay it is an insidious onset inflammation of the middle ear characterized by accumulation of non purulent effusion in the middle ear cleft so insidious very important means this is a slowly progressing disease it does not uh, occur all of a sudden so it is an insidious onset inflammation of the middle ear that we can get from the uh, words itself characterized by accumulation of non purulent effusion that is why serous and here in the middle ear cleft whenever we say a disease of the middle ear or an inflammation of the middle ear we particular in particular we mean middle ear cleft so what is middle ear cleft middle ear cleft is characterized by this uh, first laterally uh, sorry medially from the uh, nasopharynx it begins with the eustachian tube 
via the eustachian tube into the middle ear the superior part of the middle ear is called as the attic part or epitympanum just lateral to that there is aditus and aditus into posteriorly we go into the mastoid antrum and mastoid air cells so these structures together is called as the called as the middle ear cleft the eustachian tube the middle ear the attic aditus antrum and the mastoid air cells okay so we are done with the definition of serous otitis media now what happens in serous otitis media the pathogenesis so we know there is non purulent or serous collection in the middle ear and it is a slow growing disease this much we know from the definition now how it happens basically whatever secretions or whatever uh, non purulent effusion or whatever uh, in case of cases of uh, non inflammatory patho non inflammatory conditions whatever gets collected in the middle ear it gets drained into the nasopharynx by the eustachian tube so eustachian tube acts as a drainage pathway for the middle ear so whenever there is a collection in the middle ear it means there is an improper drainage or inadequate drainage of the uh, middle ear through the eustachian tube so the primary pathology here is the malfunctioning of eustachian tube and the second pathology is that even though there is a uh, properly functioning full or fully functioning eustachian tube still secretions can get collected how because of increased secretory activity of the middle ear mucosa the middle ear mucosa is made of uh, ciliated columnar epithelial cells and that has goblet cells so, so these goblet cells secrete a lot of mucus so when there is increased secretory activity also this can lead into collection in the middle ear so these are the two patho pathologies by which serous otitis media can occur okay so we now know the pathology now what leads to the pathology means what can cause increased secretory activity what can cause a malfunctioning or a blocked eustachian tube so eustachian tube dysfunction we know uh, the eustachian tube opens into the nasopharynx from the middle ear so any obstruction or inflammation or any pathology in the nasopharynx can cause uh, lead to eustachian tube dysfunction and as i already told anything in the nasal cavity can progress posteriorly into the nasopharynx anything in the oropharynx can progress superiorly into the nasopharynx so the eustachian tube end in the uh, the end of the eustachian tube in the nasopharynx it can be obstructed by means of adenoid hypertrophy chronic rhinitis or chronic sinusitis chronic tonsillitis benign or malignant tumors of nasopharynx and palatal defects like cleft palate why in palatal defects uh, the eustachian tube dysfunction occurs is the main one of the main muscles in association with the eustachian tube is the levator villi palatini and that uh, muscle has got attachment in the palate so whenever there is a palatal defect this that muscle the levator villi palatini becomes lax so eustachian tube dysfunction can occur so anything in the nasal any inflammation or pathology in the nasal cavity can progress posteriorly into the nasopharynx and cause eustachian tube dysfunction then sinusitis uh, adenoid hypertrophy chronic tonsillitis uh, that is from oropharynx it can progress superiorly into the nasopharynx so and as well as benign and malignant tumors of nasopharynx now what can cause increased secretory activity of the middle ear mucosa it is mainly allergy when the, whenever the patient has got an allergy there will be an increased secretory activity and two more etiologies are there whenever there is an unresolved acute otitis media means we have diagnosed the case of acute otitis media and we have started treating with antibiotics whenever the uh, treatment is inadequate means we have we didn't uh, treat the patient fully Me means uh, the patient was supposed to have 7 to 10 days of antibiotics we stop with 5 days that is called as inadequate treatment in those conditions the purulence in the fluid the collection in the middle ear will be over but still there will be collection in the middle ear the purulence will be over but non purulent collection will still remain in cases of unresolved acute otitis media and that can lead on to serous otitis media and of course certain viral infections can lead on to both eustachian tube dysfunction as well as increased secretory activity so these are the etiologies and also yeah this was other both are both are the etiologies eustachian tube dysfunction increased secretory activity other two pathologies and whatever causes these also we discussed next clinical feature 
the important thing that you should remember here is in serous otitis media there is no earache or even if it is there even if there is earache it will be very very mild the patient never presents with a complaint of earache in case of a serous otitis media usually uh, the serous otitis media the patient presents with hearing loss or decreased hearing sensation or delayed and defective speech why the patient presents with delayed and defective speech is that uh, mostly this uh, disease is seen in school going that is pediatric age group children 3 to 10 years 3 to 9 years or so so these patients they these children they don't tell that they have an hearing ache, uh, hearing loss sorry they they have a hear, hearing loss so what we uh, get to see is that because of the hearing loss there will be delayed development in speech the speech will be defective there will be dysarthria or defective speech so this is how patient the patient may present other than hearing loss so the two primary symptoms in case of a serous otitis media patient is hearing loss or decrease in hearing sensation or delayed and defective speech now why hearing loss occurs of course you you would be knowing because there is a eustachian tube dysfunction that causes a conductive block okay so whenever we say clinical features it has got two parts symptoms with which the patient presents and signs with which the clinician or the doctor elicits so what are the signs we can see in case of serous otitis media whenever we do an otoscopy in case of a serous otitis media that is examination of tympanic membrane we see that the tympanic membrane will be dull and opaque initially it will be retracted i'll tell you uh when there is a eustachian eustachian tube dysfunction there is a negative pressure in the middle ear you can understand no uh, negative pressure means uh, the eustachian tube in the nasopharyngeal end is blocked so there is a negative pres pressure being radiated via the eustachian tube into the middle ear so there is retraction of tympanic membrane the tympanic membrane that is situated here it gets pulled medially because of the negative pressure created by eustachian tube dysfunction so the initial stages there is retracted tympanic membrane and since the drainage from the middle ear is also collected subsequently secretions get keep on getting collected in the middle ear and finally the tympanic membrane will be, will be in a bulged state initially it will be retracted then later on because of uh, in, inadequate drainage because of the eustachian tube dysfunction there will be bulging of the tympanic membrane so these are the signs that we get to see in otoscopy in case of serous otitis media initially there will be a retracted tympanic membrane and as the disease progresses the tympanic membrane will be bulged and there will be air fluid level in the tympanic membrane because of collection in the middle ear we could, we could see while uh, doing an otoscopy we can see an air fluid level in the tympanic membrane and here one more thing that you should remember is i told in the initial stages uh, the tympanic membrane will be retracted so what are the signs of a retracted tympanic membrane first the normal what is the normal color of tympanic membrane pearly white and it has got a good luster that is a normal appearance both these will be lost that is there it will appear dull and lack it lacks luster it loses its common luster this are the first sign to appear in case of a retracted tympanic membrane and we know that the ossicle the handle of the malleus is embedded in the tympanic membrane so whenever the tympanic membrane gets retracted the handle of the malleus that is initially seen uh, oblique it becomes more horizontal because of the pulling in of the tympanic membrane and we we can we also know that the lateral process of malleus is also embedded in the uh, tympanic membrane so when the tympanic membrane gets retracted the lateral process of malleus becomes more prominent and normally uh, when there is a change in middle ear pressure we can artificially create a change in middle ear pressure by doing valsalva maneuver valsalva maneuver means we close our mouth the nose and mouth and uh, inhale air keep air in the oral cavity so that there is a positive pressure like this this is called as valsalva maneuver so by valsalva maneuver we are artificially uh, altering the pressure in the middle ear so when we do valsalva maneuver normally the tympanic membrane is supposed to uh, move that is normally it is mobile in case of a retracted tympanic membrane this normal mobility is lost so these are the signs of a retracted tympanic membrane 
it loses its normal color and loses its luster uh, uh, the cone of light will be distorted or absent the handle of malleus will be more horizontal the lateral process of malleus will be more prominent and there will be impaired or absent mobility of the tympanic membrane so these are the signs of a retracted tympanic membrane so these are the signs that we see in the initial stages of serous otitis media and in the advanced stage there will be collection in the middle layer so we can see that the tympanic membrane will be bulged out and we can see an air fluid level here in the left uh, uh, picture there is initial starting of collection of uh, non purulent diffusion in the middle layer and in the right stage in the right picture it is a well developed stage of serous otitis media we can see a air fluid level bubbles can be seen and uh since there is a eustachian tube dysfunction there is conduction block so definitely there will be conductive hearing loss so when we do tuning for test it will reveal conductive hearing loss means the rhinus will be negative in that ear and weber will be lateralized to that ear so these are the signs that we see in case of uh, serous otitis media the symptoms and signs clinical features okay now what are the investigations that we do in serous otitis media so the patient presents with two symptoms i said one is uh, defective hearing uh, or uh, loss of hearing or uh, ear block and the second is defective speech so uh, whenever there is a hearing loss we need to assess qualitatively and quantitatively means what type of hearing loss is it how much is the hearing loss so the investigation that we do is pta pure tone audiometry and pure tone audiometry reveals conductive hearing loss in the range of 15 to 20 decibel in case of serous otitis media next is another audiometric test called as tympanometry or impedance audiometry impedance audiometry measures the compliance of tympanic membrane compliance means we give a positive pressure externally into the tympanic membrane the way it vibrates back that is called as uh, compliance to check the compliance we do uh, tympanometry or impedance audiometry so when we do that in case of serous otitis media the vibration back it will be reduced means the compliance of the tympanic membrane is reduced and i already told the middle ear cleft what are the structures present in the middle ear cleft whenever there is a collection in the middle ear as the disease progresses the collection goes posteriorly into the mastoid antrum as well as mastoid aresis so the next investigation is an x-ray mastoid when we take an x-ray mastoid there will be clouding of air cells in case of advanced stages of serous otitis media an x-ray mastoid the view is called loss view or lateral oblique view okay so serous otitis media uh, the the treatment part the aim of the treatment is we know what the pathology is there is uh, fluid collection in the middle ear so what we need to do remove that fluid and prevent the recurrence this is the aim of the treatment in case of serous otitis media so in case of uh, mild or early stages of serous otitis media uh, we prefer only medical treatment there is no surgical uh, role of surgical treatment so medical treatment what are the things that we can give we already know the etiology and the pathology so in connection with that that is how we treat the uh serous otitis media medically so we have to give decongestants either nasal decongestants or systemic decongestants nasal decongestants commonly uh, we give silometazoline or oximetazoline what the decongestants does is it helps in opening opening up it means it reduce reduces the edema in the nasopharyngeal end of eustachian tube that is why we give that is why we give nasal decongestants in the form of oximetazoline or silometazoline and systemic decongestants commonly we give pseudoephedrine or phenylephrine this reduces the edema in the nasopharyngeal end of eustachian tube that is the first medical treatment decongestants next is we already told allergies and etiology so we give anti allergic measures in the form of antihistamines common antihistamines that we use are cetirizine levocetirizine pexofenadine etc so these are the two primary medical management techniques in the form of decongestants nasal or oral decongestants and 
uh, anti allergic measures in the form of anti histamines then i already told one of the etiology for serous otitis media is an unresolved acute otitis media so we have to continue giving antibiotics whenever we suspect an unresolved otitis media leading on to serous otitis media and the common antibiotics that we use are amoxicillin clavulanate combination or cefixin and as i already told uh, there are certain techniques by which uh, we can alter the middle ear pressure artificially that is called middle ear aeration uh, procedures one one i already uh, showed valsalva maneuver and another one is eustachian tube catheterization that we use a, a, a an instrument called as eustachian tube catheter we introduce it nasally and then is a pharyngeal end of a eustachian tube we just poke it with this instrument to make it open so these are middle ear aeration techniques valsalva maneuver or eustachian tube catheterization so this much with the medical part in the treatment primarily what we give is decongestants and anti allergic measures if we suspect an unresolved aom we give antibiotics and eustachian tube catheterization valsalva maneuver for middle ear aeration and in case of an advanced stage of serous otitis media there is well formed fluid in the middle uh, middle ear as well as it may it may have progressed into the mastoids in that case we need a surgical intervention so whenever there is a collection in the middle ear how how can we drain it externally by creating a hole in the tympanic membrane that procedure is called as meringotomy so the surgical treatment is meringotomy and aspiration of fluid from the middle ear and uh, as i already told uh, serous otitis media is a insidious onset means it 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 has happened gradually so even if we have drained uh, the middle ear fluid by uh, doing a meringotomy there is stands of uh, recollection there is a possibility for recollection so to prevent that we keep an instrument in the incision that we have put in the tympanic membrane called as a grommet or a ventilation tube so that the incision that we have put in the tympanic membrane it remains patent for few more days or else it gets healed easily to so prevent uh, faster he fast healing we uh, put a grommet or a ventilation tube in the incision that we have put in the tympanic membrane and in a matter of 2 3 weeks as the tympanic membrane heals by itself the tube that we have put it extrudes automatically externally into the external ear so this is a surgical treatment that is meringotomy and aspiration of fluid and to keep our meringotomy incision patent we put a ventilation tube or a grommet and whenever uh, we suspect that the uh, collection has entered into the mastoids and mastoid air cells by means of an x ray we can find out that whenever we have uh, we have a proven case of serous otitis media where there is collection in the mastoid as well we proceed with a cortical mastoidectomy so this is the uh, primary surgical treatment and we already know that the pathology in the serous otitis media the eustachian tube dysfunction is caused by a pathology in the either in the nasopharynx oropharynx or nasal cavity so whatever the pathology is present there we will have to deal with that also if it is a adenoids or nasopharyngeal tonsil that is obstructing a eustachian tube we will have to do an adenoidectomy if it is a chronic tonsillitis the edema of which has caused eustachian tube dysfunction we will have to do a tonsillectomy etc okay so that is the treatment part now uh i already told in cases of initial stages we go with medical treatment alone in advanced stages we do surgical treatment so what are the indications of surgery means when when do we say that it is an advanced stage of the disease when the effusion or when the, whenever the, the patient has presented to us we have been treating him medically with medical management but there is no resolution since 3 months so whenever there is no response since 3 months we proceed with surgery even if it is a mild disease next upon pure tone audiometry i told the conductive hearing loss usually will be in the range of 15 to 20 decibel so whenever the hearing loss is beyond 20 decibel we don't deal uh, serous otitis media medically we directly go for surgery and third 
uh, indication for surgery in serous arteritis media is whenever the eustachian tube dysfunction that has laid on, led down to serous arteritis media is caused by a nasopharyngeal malignancy so here whenever the disease is a malignancy time is very important because we'll have to deal with it uh, soon whatever the treatment be may be surgical chemo or radiotherapy whatever be it whenever there is a neoplasm this uh, in the form of malignancy in the nasopharynx that has led on to the eustachian dysfunction we'll have to do immediate treatment of serous arteritis media so that the patient can be taken up for radiotherapy soon in that case also we do not do medical treatment we directly go for surgical treatment so these are the indications for surgery in serous arteritis media okay so i told the surgery that we do in case of serous arteritis media is putting an incision in the tympanic membrane it is called as meringotomy so uh, regarding meringotomy also you need to learn a bit so meringotomy to define it it is a procedure procedure in which an incision is made on the tympanic membrane for the purpose of draining suppurative or non suppurative effusion of middle ear and to provide aeration in case of eustachian tube dysfunction by inserting a ventilation tube or grommet so we put an incision drain the fluid to make it patent we put an uh, ventilation tube or a grommet this is the procedure meringotomy and one or two things that you need to learn in case of uh, the steps of meringotomy is that one is that beer can principle means how do we put that incision like this in the antero inferior or postero inferior quadrants is what we usually put because that will that is the dependent part uh, by means of gravity fluid collection will be more there and the incision will put like this horizontal incision in by means of a in the form of a br can principle and here we are putting the grommet the grommet is in situ and i already told when we have put a grommet we needn't do another surgery to pull out the grommet in a matter of 2 3 weeks the tympanic membrane heals by itself and the grommet gets extruded out into the external canal okay what are the complications that can happen when we do a meringotomy in the middle ear we have the ossicles the uh, malleus incus and stapes are there in the middle ear and also in the inferior part of the middle ear we have the jugular bulb so we can cause injury to these injury to the ossicles particularly incus and incudostipedial joint injury to jugular bulb and when we do a meringotomy procedure in an unsterile manner it can lead on to middle ear infection and in rare cases uh, the incision that we put it may not heal leading on to a persistent tympanic membrane perforation these are the complications that can happen in case of meringotomy okay so what are the late complications of seculae in case of serous arteritis media there is uh, we know that there is a non purulent A collection in the middle ear that has led down to a bulging of tympanic membrane. So this uh, this fluid in the middle ear can cause pressure necrosis of the structures in the middle ear, leading on to atrophy of middle ear structures, ossicular necrosis, uh, tympanosclerosis. This uh, middle ear effusion can get collected in the tympanic membrane and can get in integrated into the tympanic membrane, leading on to chalky deposits in the tympanic membrane. That is called as tympanosclerosis. and rarely this can lead on to cholestatoma so these are the late sequelae of serous arteritis media atrophy of middle ear mucosa or middle ear structures ossicular necrosis tympanosclerosis and rarely cholestatoma okay so that is serous arteritis media so uh, just a review serous arteritis media is a in serious onset collection of non purulent effusion in the middle ear mainly involving the middle ear cleft so what is middle ear cleft we i already told and the other names blue ear mucoid arteritis media secretory arteritis media arteritis media with effusion these are the other names and the primary pathologies there are two pathologies a malfunctioning or a dysfunctioning of eustachian tube increased secretory activity in the middle ear and what leads on to these two also we discussed clinical features in the symptoms primarily two symptoms 
uh, uh, loss of hearing or decreased hearing, defective speech. And the signs upon examination of tympanic membrane in the initial stages, there will be a retracted tympanic membrane. What are the signs of retracted tympanic membrane? I told in the later stages, the tympanic membrane will be bulged out and we can see air fluid level and bubbles. And while doing tuning for test, we get conductive hearing loss in that ear in the form of Rene negative and Weber being lateralized to that ear. And upon investigations, we need to do the quantitative, quantitative and qualitative estimation of the hearing loss. For that, we do tympanic, tympano, uh, pure tone audiometry and tympanometry and impedance metry to uh, check the compliance of the tympanic membrane. And in advanced stages, we look for clouding of air cells, mastoid air cells in, in an X ray mastoid. And treatment, it has got two parts medical and surgical treatment. Our aim is to drain the fluid in the middle ear and to prevent recurrence. And uh, primary medical management includes antihistamines and decongestants. Uh, we usually do medical management in early stages. And in surgical management, we put an incision in the tympanic membrane to drain the fluid called as meringotomy. And to uh, make that incision patent, we put a grommet or a ventilation tube. And what are the indications of surgery in case of serosotitis media also we discussed and about meringotomy also we just discussed. So next is we are done with serosotitis media. Next is acute otitis media. Acute otitis media, AOM and acute separative otitis media, ASOM are both are one and the same. Okay. So as I told earlier, whenever there is an otitis media, in the definition, you should be saying it is an inflammation of the middle ear cleft. What is middle ear cleft? We already discussed. So acute separative otitis media is an inflammation of the mucous membrane lining the middle ear cleft. Acute inflammation of the mucous membrane lining the middle ear cleft. Leading on to pus formation in the middle ear. In serous otitis media, we told the collection is sterile, non-purulent or serous. Okay. Uh, uh, as, uh, as in the case of serous otitis media, I already told commonly seen in children, uh, a young age group. ASOM also commonly seen in two to five age group. Now, why the middle ear diseases, uh, particularly ASOM and SOM, serous otitis media and acute otitis media, why is it common in children? Because in children, upper respiratory tract infections are very common. And an upper respiratory tract infection is what primarily causes uh, uh, obstruction in the eustachian tube because of edema in the nasopharynx. So frequent URI is one of the main cause for this middle ear diseases being common in children. Secondly, there is an immature Im immune system in case of children. And in children, one other important factor is an anatomical variations in the eustachian tube. So eustachian tube is short, wider and straight in case of children. So that it is easy for the infections to spread from the nose and nasopharynx into the middle ear. Whereas in adults, the eustachian tube becomes slightly longer. It becomes tortuous and it will be narrow compared to the eustachian tube in children. So these factors lead on to one, uh, in common. Okay, so etiology in case of AOM or ASOM is what I just told. Upper respiratory tract infection is the most common etiology and seen more, more in uh, children of uh, lower socioeconomic group. Okay, so I already told the primary etiology is an upper respiratory tract infection leading on to edema or blockage of nasopharyngeal end of eustachian tube and the infection spreads through the eustachian tube into the middle ear. So how does uh, the spread of an acute infection occur into the middle ear? The main route is eustachian tube. It can also happen by two other means being blood borne that is through blood vessels directly into the middle ear an infection somewhere else in the body through the blood vessels directly getting into the middle ear. And another, the third mechanism is a tympanic membrane perforation and an infection from the external ear getting directly into the middle ear. That can, this is also a rare mechanism of 
acute separative arthritis media and acute, acute arthritis media. The three routes for infection are via the eustachian tube from the nasopharynx by being blood borne directly into the uh, middle ear and from the external ear by means of a perforation in the tympanic membrane. Okay. So, uh, just like in case of serous arthritis media, what are the predisposing factors that can lead on to uh, acute arthritis media? Recurrent attacks of upper respiratory tract infections, infections of tonsils and adenoids, chronic rhinitis and chronic sinusitis, allergy, just like as we discussed in serous arthritis media, tumors of nasopharynx and cleft palate. All these factors can lead on to a malfunctioning of eustachian tube and can lead on to an infection being spread from the nasopharynx, nasal cavity or oropharynx into the middle ear. And here one more thing that you need to know is the ciliary dysmodality disorders. Like, like primary ciliary dyskinesia, uh, Young syndrome, etc. These can also lead on to uh, secretions being uh, left over in the middle ear, leading on to an acute infection. Okay, so what are the organisms that causes AOM or ASOM? The commonest organism is Streptococcus pneumoniae or pneumococcus. Other organisms are Haemophilus influenzae, Moraxella cataralis, etc. So the organism that causes ASOM is Streptococcus pneumoniae or pneumococcus. Okay. So we now know the etiology, the predisposing factors. So what is the pathology that happens in AOM or ASOM? So there is an inflammation in the nasal. The commonest route of infection I already told is eustachian tube. So that is the pathology that we are going to discuss. There is an inflammation in the uh, nasopharynx leading on to mucosal edema of the nasopharynx leading on to increased secretion in the nasopharynx leads to uh, the spread of the secretions or purulent uh, effusion into the middle ear through the eustachian tube there will be pus and tension in the middle ear finally it leads on to perforation of the tympanic membrane and this purulent discharge of pus comes out into the external ear through the uh, perforation in the tympanic membrane Okay, so uh, clinical features in case of acute arthritis media or acute separative arthritis media, we discuss in four stages. So ASOM or AOM has got four stages. The initial stage is stage of tubal occlusion. Secondly, stage of presuppuration. Thirdly, stage of suppuration. And after, and finally, it can lead on to a stage of resolution or stage of complications. So clinical features, symptoms and signs will discuss under these stages. <coughs> so, so the first stage is stage of tubal occlusion. So uh, stage of tubal occlusion, the symptom that the patient may present with is an hearing, a hearing block. Whenever there is an occlusion in the eustachian tube, we already know there is a negative pressure being radiated through the uh, eustachian tube into the middle ear leading on to a retracted tympanic membrane. So this is what happens in case of stage of tubal occlusion. So whenever there is a retracted tympanic membrane, I already told the tympanic membrane uh, will not be vibrating normally when the, it is retracted. So the patient complains of a block in the ear. That is the primary symptom. So a retracted tympanic membrane can lead on to mild earache. So these are the two symptoms in case of stage, stage of tubal occlusion. A, a block in the ear or a mild hearing loss and a mild earache. So this stage I already told the tympanic membrane will be retracted. So what are the signs that we can see in stage of tubal occlusion? Already I told the signs that we get in a retracted tympanic membrane. The normal luster will be lost. The tympanic membrane will be, uh, the handle of malleus will be more horizontal. The lateral process of malleus will be more prominent. The cone of light will be absent or distorted. The mobility of the tympanic membrane will be reduced or absent. So these are the clinical features in case of stage of tubal occlusion. Mild earache, 
primarily the patient will complain of uh, earring block a block in the ear and the signs we just discussed next is the stage of presuppuration means secretions are getting collected the purulent effusion is starting to get collected in the middle ear so here the patient will have more hearing loss as in pre compared to previous stage ear ache will start to develop proper ear ache will be starting to develop in, in this stage stage of presuppuration and the uh, purulent effusion has started to collect so there will be fever so these are the three symptoms that you get to see in stage of presuppuration there will be fever the ear ache will be more as compared to the initial stage the hearing loss or the deafness or the earring block the block sensation in the ear increases in this stage and in this stage we get to see uh, the blood vessels getting congested there will be vasodilatation and here is the specific sign that we call as cartwheel appearance what is cartwheel appearance is this i already told the blood vessels getting congested it becomes dilated so the blood vessels run from the periphery to the center like this giving the appearance of a cartwheel so this is the sign that we get to see in the stage of presuppuration <clears throat> next is next is the stage of suppuration there is increased pus or purulent collection in the middle ear so again ear ache will be more deafness also or hearing loss will be more fever will be high grade fever and the sign the specific sign to there are two signs in case of stage of suppuration the uh, one specific sign is nipple sign means there is increased collection of uh, pus in the middle ear there will be one point where there will be maximum collection and that point will be the point where the tympanic membrane ruptures or the perforation occurs so that uh, is called as nipple sign and another uh, sign is this as the disease progresses this uh, purulent collection of pus uh, it also goes into the uh, mastoid and the mastoid axils so there will be mastoid tenderness in this stage these are the two signs in stage of suppuration nipple sign in the tympanic membrane where there is uh, maximum pus collection and the point of imminent rupture that is called as Uh, nipple sign and there will be mastoid tenderness and after stage of suppuration either the disease resolves uh, stage of resolution or it can go for complication stage of complication so uh, stage of resolution what happens is that i already told there is a point of imminent rupture that point ruptures and purulent discharge of pus starts to come out from that uh, ruptured point of perforation into the external ear and then the symptoms of the what the patient presents with when the disease is in stage of resolution is whenever the rupture occurs and pus starts to come out the ear ache or ear pain slightly decreases and fever also uh, the temperature also comes down so these are the two symptoms means the patient will tell yesterday i had high grade fever and uh, the ear ache was uh, excruciating and today the pain decreased fever also decreased and i could see some wetness or discharge being uh, coming out into, into the ear this is what the patient presents with and in this stage we see the sign that we see is a lighthouse sign lighthouse sign means from the point of imminent rupture pus has started coming out like this pus comes out so it gives an appearance of a lighthouse that is why it is called as lighthouse sign so these are the symptoms and signs in the four stages now uh, after the stage of separation rather than going into resolution the disease can go into complication stage of complications so when can the disease go into complication in these conditions when the virulence of the organism is high when the immunity or the resistance of the patient is poor when the treatment is inadequate and despite giving treatment there is antibiotic resistance these are the conditions wherein the patient goes for complications so what are the complications the com any complications of middle ear disease whether be it acute or be it uh, chronic we, we divide the complications into two intratemporal and intracranial there are four intratemporal complications can lead on to mastoiditis labyrinthitis petrocytis or facial palsy facial paralysis and the intracranial complications are 
meningitis, extradural abscess, subdural abscess, brain abscess, otitic hydrocephalus or lateral sinus thrombophlebitis. These are the intracranial complications. The complications in detail we'll be discussing along with CSOM. Okay. Okay. What are the differential diagnoses in case of a AOM or ASOM? These are the differential diagnoses. An otitis external, that is an inflammation of the external ear. So, uh, how can we differentiate from AOM? There will be a history of upper respiratory tract infection in case of AOM. And in otitis externa, there will be tragal tenderness. Next is a tympanic membrane hyperemia. That is, whenever in case of pediatric age group, whenever the child cries a lot, there will be congestion of vessels in the tympanic membrane. We can see a cartwheel appearance. So that is also a differential diagnosis for uh, acute otitis media, a tympanic membrane hyperemia. We rule out AOM by uh, if the child is like five or six years old, he'll definitely tell whether he has got an earache or not. So we see a congested tympanic membrane, but there is no earache. Means it is a tympanic membrane hyperemia. And whether if it is an infant or one or two years of age, the child, of, if, it, if he is a one or two years of age, we just look for a predisposing upper respiratory tract infection. If he had an infection, this is AOM. If he didn't have an infection, this is less likely to be AOM. And thirdly, otitis media with effusion. I already told, how can we differentiate it? In otitis media with effusion or serous otitis media, patient will be rarely having earache. Probably there won't be any earache. And finally, a fourth differential diagnosis is a viral infection called as meningitis hemorrhagica bullosa. In this condition, patient will have a bulged out tympanic membrane, not because of collection in the middle ear, but because of vesicular lesion in the tympanic membrane. The tympanic membrane layers will be uh, bulged out. So here, the bulged out tympanic membrane is not because of collection in the middle ear. Here also, there won't be an, an, a predisposing upper respiratory tract infection. This is a viral infection of the tympanic membrane itself. Okay, so AOM uh, clinical features by means of four stages we discussed. Next, how to proceed? What are the investigations? Practically, whenever we see a patient with AOM, that is patient complaints of earache, ear discharge, etc. When we see, we uh, see a uh, uh, when we do otoscopy, we see a congested tympanic membrane. We see pus being coming out. In such stages, we normally don't do any investigations practically, but theoretically, these are the investigations that we do in case of AOM or ASOM. And there is pus collection and uh, pus being extruding out of the tymp tympanic membrane through a perforation. We take that, that pus for culture sensitivity. Then we do a routine blood investigations in the form of hemoglobin, total count, differential count to know how much of infection is there, whether the patient is going for any septicemia, etc. And the, since the patient complains of hearing loss, to quantify and qualitatively analyze, we do audiometry, pure tone audiometry. And if we are suspecting an advanced stage in the disease, that is, uh, patient is going for any compli, if about to go for any complication, we take an X ray mastoid. Uh, I already told in case of serous otitis media, the view for mastoid is lateral oblique view or loss view. So these are the investigations. Now, treatment. The primary treatment in case of AOM is antibacterial therapy because here there is purulent collection. And unlike serous otitis media, where there is non purulent effusion or serous uh, effusion, there we rarely need antibiotic. So the primary treatment in case of AOM or ASOM is antibacterial therapy. And antibacterial, antibacterial therapy, commonly what we use are ampicillin or amoxicillin. The dose you are supposed to know, okay, these two. Ampicillin 50 milligram per kilogram per day in four divided doses or amoxicillin 40 milligram per kilogram per day in three divided doses. And in patients, these are penicillins basically. And in patients who are allergic to penicillin, we can use cotrimoxazol or erythromycin or cefuroxin. And the duration, the duration is there is not a cut, there is no cut and dry duration for treatment of AOM. We, we should give antibacterial therapy for at least 10 days or until the congestion in the tympanic membrane fully goes off. For at least 10 days or until the congestion in the tympanic membrane fully goes off. 
So this is the primary medical treatment in case of AOM or ISOM. And one more thing, I already told we give ampicillin and amoxicillin. How are we giving? By means of ear drops or uh, systemic. In what way give? We give. We usually give systemic antibiotics because the pathology or the infection here is in the middle ear. If we use ear drops, there is no uh, means there is tympanic membrane in between. And if, if at all, if there is a perforation in case of AOM or ASOM, it will be a very small perforation. So if we give ear drops, it won't reach into the middle ear. So we give systemic antibiotics. Only when there is a large perforation in the tympanic membrane, as in cases of chronic uh, separative otitis media, CSOM cases only, we give ear drops. So in ASOM and AOM, we give systemic antibiotics or oral antibiotics. And what are the other uh, supportive measures, as I already told, in case of serous otitis media, we give decongestant either in the form of nasal drops or systemic decongestants. Uh, nasal decongestants are oxymetazoline or xylometazoline. Systemic decongestants are pseudoephedrine or phenylephrine. And here the patient will be having pain, so we give analgesics. And whenever there is discharge in the uh, ear, we wash out the discharge. That is called as ear toileting. So antibiotics, decongestant nasal drops or systemic decongestants, analgesics, ear toileting. And surgical treatment rarely required in uh, ASOM. So what are the indications of surgical tre treatment in case of an AOM or ASOM? The surgery that we do is myringotomy only because there is purulent collection in the middle ear. We are supposed to drain that collection. So for that, we put an incision in the tympanic membrane. That procedure is called as myringotomy. So when, when do we do surgery in case of AOM or ASOM? The indications are patient complaints of severe excruciating pain. And when we examine, we see a bulged out tympanic membrane. It is about to rupture, but patient can't tolerate pain. If it ruptures, the pain will come down, we know. But patient just can't tolerate and uh, the tympanic membrane is highly bulged out. At that point, we do a meringotomy to drain the uh, pus. And in case of persistent conductive deafness or even after treating for 12 weeks, that is uh, three months of treatment. After that, we see, still see collection in the middle ear. We give, uh, we uh, do a meringotomy. These are the indications of meringotomy in the, in case of ASOM or AOM. Okay. So, uh, serous auditis media, we already had a review. ASOM also, we'll just have a review. So definition I already told, it is an acute inflammation of the middle ear cleft. What is middle ear cleft? We know. So what, are, what is the etiology? Primarily, it is because of upper respiratory tract infections. And what leads on to the upper respiratory tract infections or what are the predisposing factors? We just told. <coughs> okay. And clinical features in ASOM, we'll deal, deal it in four stages. Stage of tubal occlusion, where the symptom will be an ear block, mild earache, and the sign will be a retracted tympanic membrane, signs of retracted tympanic membrane. Next stage is stage of presuppuration. Here the earache increases, the hearing loss increases, fever starts to come in. Uh, the, the sign that we see while examining is an cartwheel appearance because of congestion of vessels from the periphery to the center. The third stage is stage of suppuration. Well-formed pus is developed. There is, there is a point of imminent rupture the symptom will be high grade fever, high earache, and hearing loss will also be high. And sign will be a nipple sign and mastoid tenderness in case of stage of suppuration. After that, it can go for resolution. That is, uh, the tympanic membrane ruptures and pus starts to come out. At that stage, patient will complain of decrease in pain, decrease in fever. And upon uh, examining, we see a lighthouse sign because of the pus being discharged from the uh, tympanic membrane, through the tympanic membrane perforation. And instead of resolving, the disease can go into complications, either intratemporal complications or intracranial complications. In what condition it, it goes to uh, complications also we discussed. Uh, poor uh, uh, immunity of the patient, high virulence of the organism, inadequate antibiotic therapy, etc. And what are the complications also we told. And upon investigation, what are the investigations that we do? Whenever there is pus in the external artery canal, uh, we take it for culture sensitivity. We do a blood routine and x-ray mastoids to look for any complication. 
pure tonodiometry to, for qualitative and quantitative assessment of the hearing loss. And treatment, uh, mainly it is managed medically and the primary medical treatment is systemic or oral antibiotics. So, uh, supportive measures are decongestants, either nasally or systemic or oral decongestants. Then we give an analgesics, ear toileting, etc. And rarely ASOM or AOM needs surgery. Surgery that we do is myringotomy. The main indication for that is a bulged out tympanic membrane and patient complains of excruciating pain. Okay. Thank you. Anybody wants to ask anything? Okay, fine. Thank you, sir. Okay. Thank you, sir. Okay, bye. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir.